ever received Christ as your Savior, I would impress that upon you. That I don't know. I don't know if you'll have another opportunity to get saved. You might. But I know you'll never have a better opportunity than you have right now this morning to receive Christ as your Savior. So I wouldn't put it off. Some are saved and they know they ought to be baptized and they put it off. And they put it off. How many times you heard us on big days when, when we have people come and uh, are saved and some start getting baptized and others people say, oh, I'll, I'll come back next week or I'll come back tonight. And, and I always impress upon them the importance of being baptized immediately. Because of those who wait and those who say they'll come back later, church, how many of those come back and do it? You don't see them, do you? You procrastinate and it doesn't get done. And so we, the, the devil always tries to convince us that we've got plenty of time to do those things. But the Bible reminds us that we're to walk circumspectly redeeming the time because the days are evil. In fact, James tells us our life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. How quickly it goes by. God doesn't want us to procrastinate when it comes to doing His will for our life and living as He says we ought to live. There are some in this room today who are living for God now, but at one point you were putting off living for God. Oh, you, listen, God has you now, but He didn't always have you. And you look back and you say, boy, I tell you what, no, nobody ever says, I'm glad I waited to surrender. I'm glad I waited to, to, to give it all to God. Oh no, the, the always the cry is, oh, I wish I'd have done this sooner in life. I wish I hadn't wasted some precious years that I could have been serving God. And I, and, and I can't get those years back. So he talks in this passage here in the first part about loving others from verse 8 up through verse 11. At the end at verse 2, verse 11. And once he gets to verse 11 through the end of the chapter where we're going to spend our time this morning, he's going to talk about living righteously. Living righteously. It's vital that in these days in which we live, God's people begin to be God's people. I mean to look like God's people and act like God's people and, and let's not just play church. Let's live like Christians. And let's be the church, not just go to church. And let's, let's let people see Christ in our lives. And so he says, first of all, he says, Christians, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. In other words, you're, you're kind of in a spiritual slumber, lethargy, apathy, indifference and unfortunately that is probably how a lot of folks go to church this morning just kind of it's ritual it's habit it's Sunday morning get up I know what to do I get dressed I go to church I sit there I listen to the pastor yell at me I, we, we pray I can't wait for Bob to sing that means we're about done and then I can go home and do what I want and, and that we come in and we go out and there's no difference, there's no change, and we don't want any. We know we're apathetic, we know we're lethargic, we know we really, God hasn't spoken to us in a long time, and we're okay with that. And Paul is saying, hey, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and realize, notice what he said, it's time to wake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed? You say, wait a minute, my salvation is nearer. Wasn't I saved immediately when I got saved? Yes, you were. But there's, but there's, I want you to look, hold your finger there in Romans. We're going to come back there or put a piece of paper in there. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I believe it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Good to hear the pages of the Bible turning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now notice what Paul writes here in verse 9. He says, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now notice, here's salvation, verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death. That's what happened when you got saved. You got delivered from the power of the second death, which is death and hell, separation from God. How did you get delivered from that? You put your faith in Jesus Christ, and God justified you. 
He made you righteous in His sight. You, you won't, listen, in that sense, listen, you're not going to be delivered from hell. You have been delivered from hell. You're not going to be delivered from the wrath of God. You have been delivered from the wrath of God. But then he says something else. Not only you delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver. So he's still delivering me from not, not the penalty of sin. The, I've already been delivered from that. But now He is delivering me from the power of sin in my life. That's called sanctification in the Bible. Okay? That's all, it's all part of the salvation that God gives us. That's why Paul said in another place, he said, it's so great salvation. Huh. It's so great a salvation. And so we have justification where it's already taken place. We have sanctification which is an ongoing process in our life where God is delivering us day by day. Nobody, no Christian has to live under the power of sin. No Christian has to live under the power of something or someone else. It's Because you, you, you have greater is He that is in you than he that's in the world. And you have that ability. So He's delivering me now. But then it says, notice, in whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. He's delivered us, He is delivering us, and He will yet deliver us. There's your salvation. Well, what's gonna, what do you mean He'll yet deliver me? One day, He'll deliver me completely from the presence of sin altogether. That's called glorification. And that day is closer than it ever has been. Than it ever has been before. We, we don't know when Christ is coming and when that day is going to happen, but I know it's closer today than we were yesterday. And that day's coming... When, when we'll be completely free and delivered from even the presence of sin. That is, that's why over in Titus, Paul wrote, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world. Doing what? Looking for and hastening unto the, the, the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. What effect does that have on us? We're going to live godly and righteous and soberly in this present world. Soberly doesn't mean I'm not going to be drunk. It means be serious about this. How serious are you about living for God? How serious are you about, about doing what God wants you to do and living the way God wants you to live? Is this a game you're playing? Just the motions you go through? Or is it really something, man, I, gotta, I better wake up. I got to slap myself. I got I got to get with it here. This is big business. This is serious stuff. And God said, "Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching." You ought, to, you ought to desire. Listen, and and we see just the opposite in our churches today. You know what? We we have churches that aren't looking for more times to meet. We have churches looking for less times to meet. Churches are cut out Sunday school and just have, let's just meet for an hour on Sunday morning. I see buildings and I, I, I get, God has to help me not to get a little uh, covetous in my heart when I see their beautiful facilities and realize they're only meeting there for like an hour and a half a week. And think, man, we could be there Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and Friday night and Tuesday night. Man, we could, we could utilize those facilities. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, that means, listen, that means God puts a premium on you being in church and being together with other believers. Don't, don't take it lightly. Don't think, well, there's, there's a ball game today and I think we'll go there. Oh, well, we're, it's a nice day. Let's go out on the lake. Listen, church is more important than that. It is more vital than that. And you don't just get flipping about it and get indifferent about it. That's what the Lord is saying. What happens when the Son of Man comes? He says they're going to be eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. They're just going to be living life. Nobody, nobody, nobody taking concern the fact that Jesus is coming back. And I don't think He's just talking about the world. He's talking about us. His people. The sands of time are quickly running out. Now, when it says over in Romans again, if you go back to Romans 13, notice verse number 12. The night is far spent, 
the day is at hand. The night there, of course, refers to Satan's time on this earth. Darkness or night is always a reference to sin. Whenever you see darkness in the Bible, it's a reference to a lack of spiritual direction in somebody's life. You walk in darkness, you can't see where you're going. Okay? You don't, you don't see where anything is. And when we say that we don't need God in our country, and we say that we can kill babies in the womb, when we say that two men or two women will constitute a marriage, when we say that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man, we are walking in spiritual darkness. We have lost our direction. We are, we are right where Paul said we'd be when he told Timothy, in the last days, perilous times will come. We're there. We're not going to be there. We're there. And, and he's saying, You're, when, when we see those days coming, the Bible says the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But he wrote to the Thessalonians and he said, uh, you are not of the night that the day should overtake you as a thief. There's not a believer here that ought to be surprised when the Lord comes. We ought to, ought to have an expectancy about it. An urgency about it. An excitement about it. Remember, remember how when you were a kid and the excitement you'd have when it was Christmas Eve? How hard it was to go to sleep? Oh, I know your mom and dad said you better go to sleep or, you know, the, the big guy isn't coming. You, you bought into that, you know. But you were excited. Sometimes if you know something's coming the next morning or maybe you're leaving on a vacation or something like, sometimes if you're leaving up real early to leave on vacation. You ever, anybody get up real early and leave on vacation before? Like four in the morning, something like that? Yeah. And how many of you woke up before the alarm clock ever even went off? Yeah. Because you know why? You kept looking up. One o'clock, two o'clock. Ah, might as well just get up and go. Let's go. Why? You're anticipating that. You're excited about that. Do you, you ever roll over and look clock and say, man, maybe Jesus is coming today. Maybe today will be the last day I'll be on earth. I think sometimes maybe this will be the last time I'll drive down here to the church. The trumpet's going to sound. Sometimes you ought to see the sun rises in the morning. It's been beautiful the last few days. Some of you who don't get up early, you need to know the sun does come up gradually. Some people think it's just God just turns up like a light switch, you know. Psh, there it is. Because by, by noon, when you get out of bed, that's about where it is already. Oh, let's wake up. Let's wake up. I don't want to sleepwalk through this thing. It's an urgency that ought to accompany our Christianity. So Paul says, wake up, but then he goes on to say something else. Number two, notice what he said. Let us therefore cast off, verse 12, the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. He says, here's what there's the next thing you want to do. You want to clean up. By the way, that's usually what you do after you wake up. At least I hope you do. He says, boy, somebody's deodorant's failing, and the guy said, can't be mine. I don't wear any. <laughs> now, he tells us what that means the works of darkness and the armor of light. He tells us what that means in verse 13. He says, here's what you do. Let's walk honestly as in the day, but here's the works of darkness, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, and not in strife and envying. Darkness, listen to me, these are things that ought not to be named among Christians. It grieves the heart of God. And it shuts out the light of God that we're to be shining to a lost world. So he says, we're going we're to uh, cast off the works of darkness. Get rid of them. And riotous, rioting and drunkenness is literally carousing. It's not, it's not rioting in the streets like we think about a riot. It's just kind of carousing around or hanging out, if you will. Parents don't... Don't let your kids just hang out. It's been a long time since I was home and I was a teenager, but even when our kids were teenagers, you know, th this idea, hey, a bunch of us are going to, we're just going down to the mall. What are you going to do? Oh, hang out. You're not hanging out. We're going to go over here. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't know. We're just going to go hang out. You're asking for trouble. 
You're asking for trouble. The, the, it's interesting how the hanging out and the drunkenness go together. How many times did, did somebody, how many uh, children, when you, when you see surveys, you find out how many uh, high schoolers had surveyed about taking their drink and they said they took their first drink at a party. What are they doing at a party like that? What are you doing there? Parent, you ought to be more, you ought to be more aware than that. He goes on to talk about chambering and wantonness. Those are words that are not normally in our vocabulary. Chambering is pretty simple. It's living together without benefit of marriage. We don't hear about that much anymore, do we? And I'm not against you. I, I, listen, I, I'm not your enemy if you're here today and you're, you're, you're shacking up with somebody. But God says marriage is honorable and all in the bed and defiled, but adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. And the proper thing to do is to separate yourselves and to live independently until God wants you to be together. But you reach forth and you don't, you don't, you don't counsel the people I've had to counsel through the years who reached ahead and stole what God had intended for them to save till marriage. And they stole it, and then they got to marriage, and guess what? It's not there anymore. And all of a sudden, it's gone. It's, it's, and you know what? There's bitter feelings there. Because that which should still be there for marriage has already been gone. It's stolen, and now there's a real empty feeling. And then you begin to get resentment that it isn't there. I deal with that. We're used to be... Used to be and by the way, it goes with wantonness because wantonness is a lack of shame. I'm talking about in the early years of pastoring. I'm only going back to the early 1980s. When I would knock on doors and visit and go soul winning and, and, and maybe get an opportunity to lead a, a man or a woman to the Lord and then ask about their wife or their husband. And I'd watch as they kind of hang their head. And they say, well... She's not really my wife. We just live together. They were embarrassed to admit that. Not, not anymore. Now, there's, there are even people who have children out of wedlock and, and they, they advertise it and put pictures up on it. And Listen, and by the way, they're, they're not illegitimate children. There are illegitimate parents. But what a shame. We've lost our ability to be shamed. Listen, it's, it's a, it, 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 wantonness is an ability to no longer be embarrassed. We're there. Can I help you? Can I help you this morning? Hey, undergarments are called that for a reason. They ought to be under your other garments. They're not to be seen. Okay, can I help you? Okay, ladies, there, that means keep your undergarments under your other garments. And fellas, pull your britches up. Nobody wants to see your undergarments. What was our shame, lady? If it used to, if she used to have her undergarments short sure or something, she'd blush and say, "Oh man, I'm sorry." Now I don't care. We've lost our ability to be shamefaced and, and to blush. Not hey, I'm not just talking about the world. I'm talking about us. Okay? Get back to propriety and, and, and modesty and decency. Stuff that stuff that we used to listen, stuff that used to embarrass us is now on television and people brag about it. And if you're, and if you, listen, you as a believer have no business watching that garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. There's nothing on, there's no, listen, there's nothing on the daytime television that's going to be worth your while watching. I don't know of anything on primetime TV that's worth watching. I can tell it's popular this morning. If you wanted something sweet, you should have went to the donut shop before you came to church. Okay? (laughs) 
chambering and wantonness, rioting and drunkenness. You think, well, that's not me, man. I'm, I, I, I'm modest and I still get embarrassed when I do something wrong or I'm not dressed properly or, and, and I'm not drinking or I'm not in the drugs and, and I'm not shacking up. Boy, I, I'm okay. Oh, he didn't stop yet, did he? What's the next two? Strife and envy. Oh, now he's going inside, isn't he? Now he's getting to where we all live. I was getting to those of us who think, well, I don't have those problems. I'm good. Strife here is personal ambition. The desire for power. The desire for recognition. The desire for prestige. It's kind of the spirit of competition. Worrying about who's going to get the credit. There's no place for that in the work of God. Well, he mentioned those guys helped. He didn't mention my name. I know where I'm not appreciated. Who are you doing it for? Who were you doing it for? You can't have, as, as Paul wrote Church of Corinth, you can't have Paul and Apollos competitions in church. You can't have that. What's church all hey, you said, well then what, what's church all about? It's all about Jesus. Amen. He's the head of the church. In all things he is to have the preeminence. We're here about Jesus. You see, it goes it goes along with the next one. Strife and what? Envying. You know what envy is? Envy is jealousy. Jealousy. Oh, they never asked me to sing in a group. Hmm? You know what that is? That's just jealousy. And that's sin. Hmm? We're, we're on the same team. How is it that, that two, two guys fighting to be quarterback for Ohio State they say, you know what? They, they don't want to necessarily have to share. They say, whichever day, one they decide, that's what's best for the team. I want what's best for the team. I just want to be on the team that wins a championship. Hmm? We need you to move from this position and play this position. Whatever's best for the team. When I first came here, Ten years ago, and we, we were having music, Bob Wallace led music. Remember that? Do you remember that, Bob? You're looking at it like, I did? No. You're not that old now. Come on. You're... Yeah. But you know what he said? He said, there's going to come a time when God's going to bring somebody in here that can lead music. He said, and, and you, don't, you don't ever feel bad about telling me to step aside. I'm just filling in here until someone can come in and do it. When Bob Reed came and said, Bob leads music, Bob stepped aside and said, okay. You know why? There's no, there's no envying. There's no jealousy there. Because we're on the same team. We're all, we're all pulling for the same. We want to do whatever is best for the team. No envying and strife. Hey, that's in, if you, can be, you can have envy in your heart. You can be striving for superiority and prestige and nobody see that. You just have it festering inside your heart. Hmm? But Paul said that's a work of darkness. Because what did Satan want? Prestige. I want this. I want to be God. Fall down and worship me, Jesus. Hmm? He wanted to be about him. Hmm? Be careful. It can, uh, that's, that's what happens in churches. churches. Churches don't get destroyed from the outside in. They get destroyed from the inside out. And it gets destroyed right there. Strife and envy. Jealousy. So he says, wake up, Christian. And, then, and listen, cast it off as soon as that thought, we'll say this in a moment, as soon as that thought comes into your mind, get rid of it. 
Say, no, that's stinking thinking. I'm getting rid of that. That's not right. Wake up, clean up, and then number three, verse number 14 is dress up. He says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You, you positively, first the positive, you put on Christ. Have you, have you ever had a determination and made up your mind that I'm, I am going to do, I am going to get as close to God as I can. I want to know Him as intimately as possible. I want to pursue Jesus Christ. I want to pursue getting to know Him. He uses the full title here for Jesus. Notice the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, obviously, it means He's the Master. He's to be over all our life. We're to be submissive to whatever He says. Jesus is our pattern. We're to follow His steps. Jesus lived His life on earth as a Spirit-filled man. That's why we can follow His steps. Don't cop out and say, ah, He was God. I can't live like He lived. No, Jesus, He wouldn't say, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. We can have the mind of Christ. And then Christ is the Anointed One or the power of God for our lives. The power of God for our lives. His power. That's why greater He did than, than He did than us and He did in the world. His power overcomes sin. His power overcomes habits. His power overcomes addictions. You see, He is all powerful. He told the disciples, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. two ways you put on Jesus. You can try to do it in your own strength or you can depend on His strength to do it. You know, what the, you know what the difference is? The difference is whether you want to take the stairs or the escalator. There's, if there's 50, 60, 100 steps to go up and there's stairs on the right side or an escalator in the middle, I think I'll take the escalator. Now, I don't have to put any effort into that. I just have to get on there. And guess what? It provides all the power I need. Now, I'll, get to the, I'll eventually get to the top taking the stairs. But sure is going to wear me out trying to get there. Why don't you, hey, and I can really get there quickly if I put some effort into it and I'm on the escalator. You ever been on the escalator and kept on walking? Whoa. I pass those people on the stairs like they're not even moving. Hmm? You know what happens when people really grow in their Christian life? Is when they put their best effort for it and they're relying on the power of Christ. Boy, they excel. They excel. And you, go, and you grow quickly. You see, he said on the negative side, on the positive side, you put on Christ. On the negative side, you, you don't make provision for the flesh. Provisions are, provisions are food. So what's he saying? Quit feeding your flesh. Quit feeding your flesh. Make provision means you have to plan ahead for it. When I'm making provision for that, it means I've planned ahead for that to happen and I'm prepared for it. How many times have we planned ahead for our flesh? So it'd be easy to do what it wants to do. You can read about somebody who, who, who oh, so-and-so fell into sin. They thought themselves into sin. You think about it. And, and all sin begins in our heart. 
You say, well, don't I think in my head? No. You think in your heart. According to the Bible, the core of your being, this is where you think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now we know that thoughts lead to actions. That's why if you don't immediately bring that thought into captivity to obedience of Christ, if you don't immediately bring that under Christ, and if it's, if it's contrary to what you know to be true about God, if you don't cast it out, it will become an action. And once it becomes an action, then, by the way, it becomes sin. Because lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin. And when, you becomes, when it becomes an action, it's easy to become a repeated action. And then it becomes a habit. And it'll become a stronghold. And it's so much easier to win the battle when it's a thought than when it's become an action. Cast out the thought. Make no previous preparation for the flesh. Wake up. Clean up. Dress up. Adoniram Judson, the missionary, said, A life once spent is irrevocable. It will remain to be contemplated through eternity. The same may be said of each day. Once a day is passed, it's gone forever. All the marks which we put upon it, it will exhibit forever. Each day will not only be a witness of our conduct, but it will affect our everlasting destiny. How shall we then wish to see each day marked with usefulness? It is too late to mend the days that are past, but the future is in our power. Let us then each morning resolve to send the day into eternity in such a garment as we shall wish it to wear forever. And at night let us reflect that one more day is gone indelibly marked in light of time are you putting on the Lord Jesus do you consciously as much as I constantly put on a suit coat or you constantly put on your dress or your blouse or your shirt this morning do you consciously say I'm putting on Jesus today I want to be clothed in him today The time is short. The time is short. You say, well, uh, they've been saying that for years, preacher, and Jesus hasn't come. I know. But even if Jesus doesn't come, I'll tell you, the time is short. How many have grandchildren in here? Anybody have grandchildren? Wow, quite a few. How many of you look at your grandchildren and can remember so easily when that was your children? that age huh yeah you ever you ever look at it and think whoa where'd the years go where'd the years go we're looking at we're, we're 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 looking in a few months at 2016 i can't believe that that's unbelievable why life's a vapor it appears for a little time and vanishes away if you're not saved I want to encourage you to be saved today. It's later than you think. And you never know. Listen, Satan likes to tell you that you're too young. Or he'll tell you you're too old. Or maybe he'll tell you you're too popular or you're too busy. But I think his favorite excuse is just say, oh, you need to get saved, just not right now. Just put it off. And he likes to do that to Christians as well. Decisions that you know God wants you to make and changes that you know need to be made and yet you say, yeah, I'm going to do that. I, I, I need to do that. When are you going to do that? If not now, when? Isn't it time to wake up? 
Isn't it time to clean up? Isn't it time to dress up? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be what we ought to be. This is a great time to live. This is a great time to be alive. Great time to impact the world for Jesus Christ. But somebody's got to get serious about this. Let's be what we ought to be for God. Let's pray. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for the encouragement and the challenge from Paul here in the book of Romans. And Father, I thank you for everyone's attention this morning. And Lord, I pray that you've moved up and down these aisles and in and out of these rows and have stopped at the seats and dealt with the hearts of people this morning. I pray you've done what only you can do in our midst of today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. But let me ask you this morning, how many folks in this room today would say, Pastor, there's a time when I knew I was a sinner who needed a Savior. And I knew that Jesus was the Savior I needed. And Pastor, there's a time in my life when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I know that I have eternal life. I know that I'm saved. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Pastor, I know that I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. If you're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I think I know about God. I'm not sure I know God. Oh, I know about Jesus, but I don't think I know Jesus. The way you guys talk about salvation, the way you talk about saved, I, I don't think that's what I have. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Would you be kind enough to just slip your hand up right now and say, Pastor, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever received Jesus. Please pray for me this morning. Would you slip it up and put it back down that I may see it today? Let me pray for you. You couldn't raise it the first time, but you'd raise it this time. Would you do that? All right, I see that. The message was to believers today. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat this morning. I don't know whether it's just to wake up, get, it, get some urgency with your Christianity again, or whether it's to clean up. There's some things in your life that you know ought not to be there. And you need to cast off those works of darkness. And you need to dress up. You need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to stop making provisions, prior preparations for your flesh. God spoke to your heart this morning. You say, preacher, I needed that message today. God spoke to my heart. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me, Christian? Pray for me. There you go. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. You may be here today and say, there's a decision. There's some decisions that I know God wanted me to make, and I've been procrastinating. I've been putting them off. But I got the wake-up call this morning. And preacher, I'm going to make that decision today. Would you slip your hand up and say, that's me? Amen. 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 That's good. Don't put it off, Christian. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. And Father, I'm praying that each individual now will do what you've told them to do in their heart. Just as you have spoken to them through your word, I pray they would speak to you on bended knee at the altar. And Lord, whatever it is that you're prompting them to do, they would obey. I want your will to be done in these next few moments. That you would do what only you can do in this invitation time. Those who need to receive Christ and they've never been saved, may they come and receive you as their Savior today. Maybe they're saved, never been baptized, and they say, I need to be baptized. 
Maybe they're saved and they're baptized and they ought to belong to a church. They say, this is where we ought to belong and we want to serve God. Maybe they just need to surrender to be a full-time servant of God. There are some other things that you've prompted them to do to, that they need to cast off and get out of their life and they'd come and bow their knee and surrender those things and leave it at the altar today. Whatever it is, Lord, that you've dealt with hearts about, I pray they'd respond to you. Thank you for speaking to our hearts today. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, you stand to your feet if you would please. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. And as he sings, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to the Lord this morning. Will you please? Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion self and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. Send a revival, start the work in me. Thy word declares, thy will supply our need. For blessing now, O Lord, I humbly plead. Go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would. We're getting the name down front here, and we'll get that for you in just a moment. Remember the cards at the back of the uh, auditorium when the service is over? They'll get those cloths, tablecloths off so you can see what you want to choose from. Okay? Thank you. All right. We're glad to have Shane and Michelle Manning coming this morning. And uh, folks have been coming for a while. And uh, uh, Michelle has been saved and baptized. And we had a visit with them. And heard her testimony, and uh, Shane accepted Christ uh, as his Savior a year and a half ago, maybe, something like that, two years ago, and, um, but had not been baptized, and so he's coming to get baptized today, and uh, they both want to unite membership with our church, so that's great, and uh, congratulations to them, and uh, um, Shane, you follow Brother Bob right here, he'll get you downstairs and start getting you ready for baptism, and we'll get ready to baptize Shane this morning, and all those in favor of welcoming them into the fellowship of our church, let it be known by hearty eye Aye. and opposed by like sign. That's great. That's exciting stuff. Uh, these are good folks, and I hope you get a chance. Some of you have chatted with them a little bit, and hope you get to know them. Uh, delightful, delightful people. 
and uh, they'll be a great blessing to our church. Amen. We're glad you're here. Amen. All right, let's get ready to baptize. Brother Bob, you take it from here. Well, let's, uh, let's sing a few favorites today. Brother Pete, 212. We'll start with you here. 212. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. On that first, when I saw the cleansing fountain. Two hundred forty-six, two four six. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, on to higher ground. Two four six. On that first together, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm engaged. 507. 507. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. I love this song. On that first, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that Sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Mandy? 538. 538, blessed be the name of the Lord, 538, all praise to him who reigns above. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might then redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Miss Van Gelder. Number 11. I like this one too. Amen. Number 11. This is good. He is mine. Long before the fall of man. Long before the fall of man. God designed a master plan. He exchanged the sin.
sing that second together. Through God's mercy and His grace. to have Shane Manning here and Shane upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command. I baptize you my brother in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And the servant said, Master it has done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. Three hundred forty-one. Absolutely. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. Now, most of you might know by now what I mean by are you style. Let's sing this are you style, all right? Let's sing it with our whole heart. Let's sing that first together. I heard an old, old Like you have victory in Jesus this morning. Let's sing that last together. I heard about a man.
staying together shall we all right let's pray shall we father thank you for a wonderful morning this morning lord it's been good to be in the house of the lord thank you for each one that made their way here today most of all lord thank you for speaking to our hearts we thank you for shane and michelle and for leading them our way pray your blessing upon their lives now father dismiss us with your care Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. Bring us back safely for the service tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Bye-bye. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.